Uh, well, I want to start by, I can't remember if I asked you this before, but where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in a small town called Covington, Louisiana. Okay. And uh, so I'm curious, what, if any, memories do you have of education? Oh, a a absolutely. Well, I was taught from a very early age the importance of education. And it's because of my grandparents and my parents. Uh, my mom's dad grew up absolutely dirt poor. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not graduate from high school. And he actually joined the armed services and then pulled himself up by his bootstraps. Uh, he did quite well for himself through hard work. And I did not have to want or need for, for anything. Uh, now, because of that, I, I took education very seriously. I was taught from a very early age that the amount of work you put into uh, your education years really can help determine what you do for the next 40 or 50 years afterward. But I was also taught, because of where my family came from, that even in this day and age in our country, not every student has that same opportunity that I had. Uh, so that was hugely impactful on me. Uh, and on the flip side, my dad's mom was actually a, a teacher. Mm -hmm. She was an elementary school teacher. Um, so one of her favorite sayings that she would say all the time was, work hard, get a good education, and save your money. Um, and it is, it, that, that really stuck with me and influenced me and uh, made me want to go make a difference for students that didn't have the same opportunity I had, which led me into the work I find myself today. And so do you remember growing up, you know, either when you were a kid or in your adolescent or adolescence or in high school, you know, thinking that you wanted to be a teacher or go into education in some manner? You know, interesting question. It really didn't, it didn't strike me until I was in college. Okay. Um, and, I, and I will give credit to the Teach for America program. I was a junior in college and I knew that I probably was going to go to law school at some point. But I wanted to do more for my community. I wanted to, to give back to society uh, before going off and spending three years in law school and then, and then possibly going on to a law career. Uh, and I was looking for the right uh, way to give back, the, the, the right way to get involved and find a solution to a problem that I saw as a major issue. And uh, that is actually where I found the Teach for America program, which even spoke to me in, in that passion I had for education and said, we're recruiting some of the top college students in the nation to come teach in some of the hardest circumstances in the nation. And we want you to come, and whether you plan to stay in education as your full-time career, or if you want to come make a difference for a few years, and then go off to another profession and still make an impact on education through policy, we want you in the classroom. And it immediately gave me an opportunity to go teach at West Charlotte High School where if I was not there in that classroom, my students would have had a permanent substitute teacher. Um, so you know, here I was, young and hungry to make a difference, uh, working you know, long hours every day for my students, uh, as opposed to a permanent substitute that would have come in every day. It was, it was a great opportunity for me to really give back, but also to learn what the, the, the challenges were for our system. Uh, and that put even more fire to my feet to one day try to make a difference uh, from some other angle, from some other aspect. And that ended up being the policy world. You've been in office now nine months. What have you learned about yourself in that time? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I guess uh, determined. determined. Um, more, more so than ever, uh, you know, I have been tested with challenges, uh, but I am determined that we will get to a point in our nation where every student, no matter what their neighborhood, no matter who their parents are, no matter what their background, will have the opportunity to go to a school, get a great education, work hard, and succeed. Uh, that is what drove me when I was in West Charlotte High School teaching in a very difficult cir uh, circumstance. Uh, that is what drove me when I ran for a countywide election for a school board seat. It's what drove me when I was literally driving around this entire state uh, knowing that, that I could win this election and bring that change to the status quo that would give that opportunity to students. Uh, and now it's driving me in, in the work I'm, I'm doing today in this office. Uh, we've had a lot of successes over the summer and also we're going out around the state to hear about great things that are going on so we can actually scale them throughout the state. You know, 
know, part of this job, especially being such a high profile job, comes with criticism. Yes. What are some of the common misconceptions about you, Ethan? Where, <laughs> what are people wrong about? Uh, that I just graduated from high school. Um, <laughs> it's actually one of my, it's actually uh, one of the, my favorite introductions that someone did about me once. It was, you know, isn't this an amazing country? Here is a young man whose grandfather didn't even graduate from high school. And then he decided he'd go off and teach in one of the toughest high schools in North Carolina. And, you know, only in America could that kind of story, could this young man then be the leader of all the high schools in North Carolina. But we know what everyone's thinking. Only in America could someone who looks like he just graduated high school lead all the schools in the country, in the, in the state. So uh, that, was, that was a fun one. Uh, but, you know, don't underestimate me. Uh, I am extremely driven to make sure this happens in my lifetime. And I know that we have the great teachers, the great principals, and the great leaders of our school system to bring that opportunity to every student. And I believe that with the transformations that we're working on in my office, to bring in the right blend of technology, uh, to create the pathways for all students to find their route to success, I know that we will one day be that nation where every student can go to school, work hard, and succeed. I know in editorials that I've read that people have described you as a dream for um, Phil Berger or Tim Moore saying that they give you marching orders. They'll tell you what to do. What is your response when you hear things like that? I have a great working relationship with the General Assembly uh, and our visions actually align uh, very similarly. Uh, but it's a working relationship. It's a give and take. We don't agree on everything uh, and we work together on what we do agree with. And what I'm very excited about is what you'll see in the next few years as we start to investigate where the right investments are for education that will have the, the return on investment we need for our students who need it the most, uh, we'll be bringing that to the General Assembly and we'll be asking for those investments. Uh, so I, I look forward to continuing my good working relationship with them. So one of the things that I think you probably, well I'm pretty sure you disagreed with them on were the budget cuts to DPI. Um, you know, and you said they were challenging, but you, you weren't out there, uh, you know, advocating against them publicly. I don't, I don't think you're doing privately. Um, but uh, why, why not? Well, look, I ran for this office to change the status quo, and that's not just for the school system as a whole, that's also for this department. You know, it, it is very easy when you're the leader of a bureaucracy to say, if you cut us, the sky's going to fall uh, and the world's going to end. And a lot, of, a lot of leaders of bureaucracies will say that, uh, but quite frankly, we know in this building that we need to be doing a better job and we need more transparency. We need to take ownership of, of where we're not doing the best job. One example is the teacher licensing department. You know, the teacher licensing department is, this is an issue I raised on the campaign. As soon as I took office, my inbox started getting emails from teachers. I've been waiting five months for my teacher license. I've been waiting seven months for my teacher license. Now, this isn't a fault of the people in the licensing department you know they're doing what we ask them to do but they're in a machine that hasn't been reviewed in years uh, they are stuck in this machine in this day-to-day -day routine uh, that we need someone to come in and look at and say how can we do this better you know where can we innovate to make sure we're the best customer service agents to our clients who are our teachers so we actually had a third party reviewer come in and do a third party operational audit of our, of our licensing department. And we're gonna be discussing the results of that soon and actually implementing those changes. I mean, that's something that hasn't been done in this department in years, maybe decades. And I'm also excited about the money that was given to us for the full operational review of this department. What, where are things that we're doing well? Let's make sure we keep doing that and scale that up. What are things we're not doing well? If we're not doing something well, we need to know about it, and we need to uh, act with transparency uh, to bring a culture of ownership to those issues. And I'm very pleased with how the professional staff in this department has been responding to my goals of urgency and ownership and innovation. Uh, they want the same thing for this department, and I'm excited over the next few years of what we're going to be able to show 
uh, the state and the taxpayers for their return on investment of, of the support we can bring for schools. Well, I think to follow up on his question, I, I was interested, and I think a lot of people were interested, why we didn't hear more from you when the budget cuts were announced. Um, you know, I know you mentioned uh, you mentioned to you in July that that mm -hmm. you know you didn't necessarily agree with them, but why not speak out more publicly about that? We well, you know. We have a relationship with the General Assembly, and we were having those conversations. Uh, and you had, again, a state board that was, you know, screaming that the sky is going to fall. Um, and that's just not productive. You know, it, it can get you some time in headlines, uh, but it's not a productive conversation of what do we really need to be doing to improve this department. And that's the conversation that we're having. And that's why I'm very excited and optimistic about this third party review of the operations of this department uh, to really point out what we're doing well and where we need to improve and then showing the state that we are working to improve in those areas. I want to back up really quick if that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, I want to go back to the time between the election and when you actually took office. So I was talking to Rebecca Garland and, and a number of people who have since left has says, said there was not much communication between you and DPI until you took office. Rebecca Garland said that she thought there was responsibility on both sides for that and that there were you know, likely outside factors that made it harder for there to be communication. I'm curious why you would say there wasn't a lot of communication prior to taking I, office. You know, I, I will point you uh, to talk to my chair of the transition, Jonathan Feltz. Um, I think he'll be able to give you some insight on that. Uh, I'm really not here to rehash what happened in between the election and when I took office. I'm really focused on the future. Well, that's one of the things we want to talk about, the future. And Absolutely. We've been on a listening tour, um, and I spoke with the, the principal of the year, um, and he was saying, you know, I, I am really glad to see that the superintendent is on this listening tour, but we want to know what are his ideas, what, you know, so what are the big ideas? Um, that you have for, for changing schools in North Carolina? Great, thank you for that question. Uh, let me take a sip of water before <laughs> I tell you uh, everything we've been working on. Thanks. Uh, so let's start uh, chronologically. Let's start mm -hmm. with, with birth. We have been working hard uh, knowing that there's so much that happens before children get to school that impact how they do in school. So the first thing I did when I got here is I realized North Carolina has Read to Achieve. It's a program that's working. It is, it is helping drive results in kindergarten through third grade. But those teachers only have those students in that small span of time from kindergarten to third grade. If we have students who come in two or three years behind, uh, we're asking kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade teachers to grow students from you know age one or two all the way up to where they need to be on reading level for third grade. We decided we need to start bringing some highlights to the work that we can have parents help with and empower parents uh, to really help their children be ready for kindergarten. And that's why the first thing we did was start NC Reads. Uh, NC Reads is going to be building out over the course of the next few years to reach out to parents of, of children who aren't school age yet and really encourage them and empower them with the knowledge of even if it's just one or two books a day, reading to your student just that little amount will help them be kindergarten ready. If those students are kindergarten ready when they enter our public schools, our public schools can successfully guide them through growing through third grade, sixth grade, ninth grade, and into graduation. What we did on the legislative end is championed the new uh, B through three council. Uh, and we're gonna get a new position at DPI, the Associate Superintendent for Early Childhood Education. The, the goal of this is to come to the consensus of, yes, we know pre-K is a good thing. We know pre-K works. We've seen the studies. On the low end, it is estimated that every dollar spent on pre-K returns $4 into the economy. On the high end, it is estimated that every dollar spent on pre-K uh, brings back $16 to the economy. We know it's a good investment. What's the best place to invest? 
So that's what this B3 Council is going to come together around. It's going to be led in a bipartisan manner. Uh, I'm going to be one of the leaders, and then one of uh, Governor Cooper's secretaries over at DHHS is another leader. Uh, so it's bipartisan, it's interagency, it's saying once and for all, let us come together and decide what the best early childhood interventions are so that we can help prepare students for their K through 12, which will help them succeed later on. And I'm very excited about, uh, we're in the process of creating the position for Associate Superintendent of Early Child Education. Very excited about having that person come on and join the team and, uh, and be another supporter for that initiative. So moving out of the early years into that early childhood, we are focusing uh, a great deal on personalized learning. Now, personalized learning is using the appropriate blend of technology in the classroom with the expertise of a great teacher. I'm very clear whenever I talk about personalized learning. Nothing will ever replace the teacher in the classroom. The teacher in the classroom is the most important part of the classroom. The technology that we're using with this blended kind of digital age learning is to come in and be a tool for the teacher and the students to empower both the teacher and the students. It, it, it works like this, and we've seen this across the state. Uh, some, stu some school systems are further ahead. Uh, in implementing personalized learning than other school districts. Uh, we have the vision of, of bringing uh, that innovation to every school system statewide. Uh, the, the teacher becomes almost more of an instructional coach. The students using technology and the, the right content can actually go through the lessons at the pace that's right for them. And instead of, you know, having to take a lesson and maybe mastering the material, maybe not, but then having to move on, those students can actually take the time they need to master the material. Now teachers, being the instructional facilitator, will be able to monitor those students where they are. If some students are falling behind, a teacher can swoop in with those students and give them the specific resources and help they need in order to catch up to the rest of the class. But just as important, if there are students who are excelling, if there are students who are gifted, if they are working ahead of pace, they can keep going. I saw this when I visited uh, Craven County Early College. Uh, students in that classroom had the ability, if they wanted to, to work ahead. And the teacher could monitor their work as they went because the technology made it possible. All the content was there. It was up to the student's pace. And those students, after working ahead, were actually able to walk over to a community college and start taking community college courses. Uh, this is the type of tra positive transformation in education that is going to be possible in the next few years and something you'll see our office really driving to expand across the entire state. And the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is my passion for encouraging every student to find the pathway that best fits him or her towards their own success. I, I saw it in my years of teaching. Plenty of students who were under the assumption that if they didn't go to a four-year college, they weren't a success. And I just, I, I told them over and over again, it's not true. You know, maybe we, maybe as education leaders, it came from a good place that we wanted to tell every child, go to college, but it's just not the only pathway to success. And we are very focused in this office on being the bully pulpit for letting parents, teachers, school leaders know that all these multiple pathways to success should be available to students. Uh, one, in the legislative session, we worked with the General Assembly to do the Future Ready Students. So Future Ready Students is actually going to be encouraging uh, local school districts to partner up with community leaders and business leaders to connect what the needs are in those communities to the school district. And I'll give you an example of how this works. I was in uh, Caldwell County and we went to a masonry competition. These were high school seniors and they were competing building specifications for a brick wall. Now this is very precise work. You have to pay attention, you have to know what you're doing. These high school seniors who had that training 
were getting job offers on the spot that day. One got a $5,000 signing bonus and was going off to work in the construction market in Charlotte, and he's going to be making $50,000 a year. We then went down to Catawba County, and we walked into a high school classroom that had welders in it. These students, high school seniors, were all welding, and they were being taught by a community college professor. So they were not only going to graduate with their high school diploma, but also with a uh, certification in welding, and many of them were going to go off to advanced manufacturing where they can make sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. That's a pathway out of poverty. That is opportunity for every student, and I am just so excited to be able to be the, the bully pulpit for we have got to let students know that's possible. We've got to let them know that, you know, take a high school diploma and go to that community college and get a little bit of extra certification and go out and have a career. And if you want to, go back to that four-year institution. Every student should and must have the opportunity to go to a four-year institution if that's what they want, but it's not the only pathway to success. And I'm really, you can tell, I'm really excited about, about championing that for our students across the state. Um, um, okay, we'll follow up on that. Go ahead. Can I ask a different question? Okay. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I just wanted to ask you really quick. Uh, we had talked in July about the 10 positions that the General Assembly gave you, mm -hmm. and you said that uh, you basically had to wait until they were certified. Yes. Are, are we anywhere closer? To we are getting we are getting very close. And but that but they haven't been it hasn't been certified. Uh, the the budget has likely been certified by now because we are now creating those positions okay. um, and I'm in talks with people about coming on and joining my team. Okay, uh, so can you give us a better idea of what cannot, those positions are? Not yet, uh, but as soon as, as soon as we have that set, we will definitely let you know. I can tell you, I'm excited about having uh, uh, more people focused on transforming the education system, moving out of the status quo on my team. But uh, one of those will be the chief of staff position? Uh, yes, yes. I can tell you, I can tell you we will have a uh, chief of staff. With the lawsuit that's ongoing, if this um, resolves in your favor, what's the first thing you'll do? What's the, the major change you want to make? Well, again, it, for me it's all about urgency, ownership, and innovation. And I have to tell you, put this lawsuit aside, most of the professional staff at this department have really uh, championed those principles as well. Uh, so I've really enjoyed working with the professional staff. I think if you're looking for a seismic shift, you're not going to find it. I mean, there's not going to be this uh, you know, tidal wave of change that's going to come bursting through the doors at DPI. It's going to be much more case by case, much more systematic. Uh, you'll see me reorganizing the org chart uh, to make things uh, more accountable and transparent. Uh, and you know, working really against the status quo. I mean, the status quo of this building for too many years has been a system of non-accountability. And that will be the number one driver of ownership. Uh, I want people to own the problems and then w we will work together to find solutions. So what would be your major change you would make first? Uh, the moving into that culture of accountability. Uh, I think you would see that in the organization chart. Instead of uh, everyone reporting to a board of 13 people that show up once a month, uh, it would be much more day-to-day -day management uh, reporting to me, getting things solved quickly and efficiently, being able to respond quickly to the needs of our schools. I had a question. You said one time, I think it might have actually been your very first board meeting in January, you said, Every day we don't take bold actions for our students and teachers is a day they lose. In your time here, what do you think is the boldest action that you've taken? <laughs> uh, fighting the status quo. Uh, I am, uh, in January, I went and I joined the case of the state board suing against this change. The state board actively saying they want to protect the status quo. It is not acceptable. And you are exactly right. Every day that goes by is another day lost for some of our most vulnerable students. And you know, we are talking about uh, years, we're talking about decades, where we have had an education system that, not for the fault of teachers, teachers are working hard, not for the fault of principals, principals are working hard. It's a system that needs to be urgently transformed 
to really provide the opportunity for every student. And that is what I'm extremely excited about, and that's, that's why I get excited when I talk about uh, you know, working with uh, children who are before they get to school, working to personalize learning with the right blend of technology that's going to help every student own their own education, and working to find the right pathways for all students. It is, it is that breaking out of the status quo of what we've had uh, for generations where we're really going to make the difference for students. What, uh, what do you think the future holds for you career-wise? Do you have any interest in maybe pursuing other offices? Right now, I want to lead the Department of Public Instruction. That is my main goal. And uh, besides that, when we're not actually leading because of being held up by the lawsuit, we are running down these bold visions of what education can become. And using uh, the bully pulpit of our office and working with the General Assembly to make sure we address early childhood education, we address personalized learning, and we address getting better pathways for all students. I was curious, what, what is the most challenging moment you've had since you've been in office? How did you handle it? What did you learn from it? The most, the most challenging has been the lawsuit, I'll be frank. You know, I'm, I'm very much impassioned by transforming a system that is in the status quo. And the State Board of Education is tying my hands in court in order to protect the status quo. Uh, I've worked very hard to get here because I am determined that in my lifetime I will see every student in our nation have that opportunity that I had, that my daughter has. Every student in this country deserves that opportunity. And we're not going to get there with the status quo. It is going to take positive transformation of our education system. And we are, we are working on that every day in this office. Um, and anyone who is defending the status quo, uh, I will make sure that we move them out of the way and we bring positive transformation for this education system. What's something new? Tell us something new that you want to do that nobody has heard of yet that you haven't talked about that is an idea that you have that you're <laughs> hoping to focus on. <laughs> Well, we're working on some fun things with NC Reads. Uh, I'll, say, I'll say that. It is, it is great to have a statewide reading initiative for the state of North Carolina. Um, so we've been, we've been working on some fun things with that that I'll share with you if, if they come to fruition.